All right, welcome back to the last section of chapter three here, where we're going to finally record our deposits. Okay, so once again, as we mentioned this from the very beginning, what happens to the money when we receive it? Well, just like what we mentioned before, right, when you receive a check in the mail, right, what do you do with it? It won't magically appear in your bank account. You need to do one or two options, right? Go to the bank and deposit it manually. Or two, you go ahead and if you're going to be using your online mobile banking app, take a picture of the check and deposit it, right? Now, often when in times when you have in-store sales, right, what happens to the cash that you receive from your sales, from your in-store sales? You don't want to necessarily leave the cash in the register. So again, you're going to have to end up taking that extra cash that's in the register and actually physically deposit it. So that's exactly what an un, what the undeposited funds account does is when you receive money, you need to collect all that money and then you're going to eventually take it to the bank and actually physically deposit it so it shows up in your checking account. So let's take a look at that undeposited funds again account, right? So we are associated ours with the receive um the receive uh, payments to deposits window. So I'm going to go ahead and go check out my checking account. So I go into my chart of accounts and I'm going to go ahead and check out that undeposited fund. So in this case, um, I named it as receive payments to deposit. So right now it tells me that I'm outstanding $4,289.47. Okay. So how do I go ahead and make my deposits? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and visit my best friend here. And on the far right side, you have bank deposits. Okay. So when I have bank deposits, there are, it's important that you know that this rule must be intact, that you're going to make separations between your different forms of payments. Okay. Especially with your credit card payments, right? Your cash and your checks should be standard they can go they can go in together but your credit card payments is what's going to be always separated right because credit card companies right when you allow your customers to pay you via credit card what you're essentially doing is you are asking the credit card company to go ahead and um re uh, collect the money for you and give you an advance payment so in this case, instead of you keeping track of your customers and, um, you know, sending them invoices to try to your best to collect the money, we'll talk about that in Chapter 5.2, where we talk about bad debt. What happens when your customers choose not to pay or don't pay you a, a, to pay you for what they owe you, right? Then it becomes another whole can of worms where you're dealing with this customer and, um, you know, you're going to be, you know, sending them invoices after invoices and trying to collect the money. Well, that's what the credit card company can do for you. If you allow customers to owe you on uh, or to allow you to pay you with a credit card, right? You're essentially saying to those credit card companies to collect the money for from the customers for you and advance that payment to you so you can go ahead and continue your operations as a company, right? So by doing that, that means so that means the credit card company is going to be taking care of the accounts receivable for you on their own terms, right? And for that, they're going to ask something in return because you are essentially using this company to collect the money, to collect the debt for you from your customers. So by doing so, they're going to be either asking you a flat rate, so it could be 50 cents per uh, credit card transaction, so a convenience charge. Usually that's, a, that's called a credit card charge um, for the convenience. Um, or they can charge you based on a certain percentage of your sales. So usually flat rates are going to be based on if it's like $20 or less or something like that or $100 or less, but any amount that's over those amounts is going to be subjected to a percent of your sales. Now, this is what QuickBooks can do for you. If you buy into QuickBooks Payments, which is a subscription, right, 
it actually helps you and allows you to collect those money from your customers via using a credit card and by paying into the subscription that subscription will help you also pay all of those different credit card um, companies out there so of course we know that there are many different credit card companies such as visa mastercard discover american express right by by um buying into the um quickbooks payment subscription it will help you facilitate and accept all of those types of formal payments especially the more popular ones right visa and mastercard now of course not only do you uh, does that help you allow you to collect that money uh, from your customers right it also helps it make it easier for you to also use your credit card and also make it feasible to uh pay other stuff using your credit card okay so that is what's great about using that um quickbooks payment feature now of course if you don't pay into it you have to also know that that means every credit card company is going to want a different type of percentage so visa might charge you two percent um, and MasterCard might charge you 3%, right? It really depends on what the credit card services is and what agreement terms that you create with those credit card companies, okay? All right, but so that's just a little fun fact there about um, knowing about um, having those types of um, credit card companies or allowing those credit card companies to pay you uh, and uh, take over the accounts receivable for you. So again, um, so if you ever have uh, any friends or any uh, people that you know who are independent contractors or who um, own their own business, right, usually sometimes they'll tell you, hey, don't pay me with a credit card, pay me um, uh, full in, either in cash or, you know, give me a check because they get to, they get to keep 100% of the sales instead of only take a portion of the sales. So let's go ahead and take a look at this um, bank deposit here. Right, where are we going to be depositing this money to? We're going to be depositing this money to our checking account. Okay, for which date? So we're going to say we're going to uh, deposit the money on the 21st of January. Okay, any tags here? Oh, uh, no, nothing here. Right, we want to show all payments for the location so you can choose your location of where you want to sell. Uh, um, make your deposit from. So again, I'm gonna go ahead and click Walnut Creek. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna uh, you're gonna um, shorten your list down by the payments that you were uh, filtering it through by the um, location. So in this case, we're going to do first our deposits are gonna be our credit card deposits first. So we're gonna take a look at Liz Cadell's um, payment and Ms. Veronica uh, Vasquez's payment, right? So again, we're going to be taking a look at their payments for a total of eighteen sixty five thirty seven. Now, because we know that this is a merchant fee, we're going to also add another line item to um, to calculate that merchant fee out from my checking account. So then, I only actually receive a portion of the money, which is I'm only going to receive eighteen oh nine forty one, right? All right. So therefore. I'm going to go ahead and do that. So I'm going to go ahead and click on Liz Cadell here and Ms. Veronica Vasquez. Okay. So right now I'm pending at 1865.37. Now we know for a fact that this company uh, uh, is going to charge us a 3% on our total sales. So now we got to go ahead and add our line item here to take out that merchant fee. So the person that is going to be charging me is going to be National Bank uh, National Bank um, here. Um, account is going to be merchant fees, okay, merchant or service fees. So I have uh, merchant account fees, no. Um, let's go ahead and put service fees or bank service fees. So right here, bank fees and services, service charges. Okay, so we click on that, right? Description is going to be merchant fees, merchant service fees, okay? Right, 
uh, payment method. So we're going to say it's uh, via um, ACH. Right, and it's going to be for the total amount. So this is where we need to use our quick math um, section here. So we're going to figure out what 1865.37 times negative 3% because we want to make sure this subtracts out of our account for negative $55.96. And once again, this is for the store location. Okay. Right. So then down below, we're going to go ahead and this is the section where do you have a petty cash fund? If you do, you want it. Do you want to um, get cash back for this? So, yes, you can designate a cash back if you have a petty cash um, uh, drawer here. Right. Uh, usually that's rule of thumb if you're going to be um, recording your deposits. Right. And you want cash back. What account do you want to associate that with? So if you want to have that, you can. And there you go. So it's that negative $55.96 is going to be taken out from your checking account and going to merchant fees. You're actually only really recording 1809.41, which is exactly what we want, right? Okay. And then once everything looks good, we can go ahead and click save and new. Okay, because we're going to do another deposit. Okay. So there you go. Here is the new deposit here. So there you go. It just gave me the signal that the, the, second, the first deposit has been cleared. Okay. So then the next one we're going to make a deposit for is going to be um, our cash deposit for Neo Garcia. Okay, so in this case, we deposit it on the 18th of January. It's going to go to our checking account. And what you're going to do is you're going to end up taking an owner's draw out of this. Um, and you're going to um, enter in Ernest Weathers, Withers. Okay, and that's going to be for an owner's draw for $4.10. So in this case, um, they so um, Franeo Garcia. We received a payment and we end up taking cash back box for four dollars and ten cents for the Walnut Creek location. So let's go ahead and record this uh, deposit right here and take some cash back with me. Okay. So let's go ahead and again the the uh, we're going to deposit this to my checking account. Okay, uh, and it's going to be for the 18. Okay, we're going to identify that uh, we have a payment from Neo Garcia. Okay, and we're going to go ahead and um, check mark that. So we have a total of $44.10. So we're going to deposit $40. And we're going to keep $4.10 for um, the change, right? And we're going to go ahead and add another line here for um, receive from. Okay, so in this case, we're going to actually um, put in the owner here, right? Because we're going to put an owner's draw here. So again, receive from. In this case, uh, we have um, earnest. Ernest Withers. Okay. And of course, when we type that in here, we need to add this uh, person in here. So again, right, they're going to be, um, right now it says under customer. Uh, we're going to change that to, um, I believe we have that as an, under an employee. Okay. So we put Ernest as an employee, but he's really the owner. Okay. And I'm going to go ahead and save this. Okay. And what's going to happen is they're going to have an owner's draw. So if you type in owner's draw, right, this account should be there. There it is, owner's draw. 
All right, and then I'm gonna say odor. Odor keeps change. Right. Um, payment method. Cash. Okay. Um, for the amount of four dollars and ten cents. Okay, so you, I'm gonna go ahead and do a negative here. Negative four dollars and ten cents. And what is this for? I'm gonna go ahead and call this admin. Okay, and then there you go. That means you're gonna be depositing forty dollars, right? Right, because this cash isn't for uh, any other cash except for the owner's withdrawal. Okay, so yes, once again, yes, the the owner can take money, right? He owns the business; he can take whatever he wants as long as he records and reports that he took the money for an owner's draw, okay? And then, I'm gonna go ahead and save and close, okay? Or save and new, right? Last deposit that we're going to enter in is going to be uh, recording all of our checks that we have collected. So again, we're going to deposit all the checks from one for Medilla Builders and of course, uh, Linda Fulton, okay? And we're going to deposit it as of February 15th. Now this one, we're also going to also add in a new line to deposit for an owner's investment, okay? So first off, we're gonna go ahead and identify and select those two checks for Medilla Builders and for Linda Fulton. And let's see, we have the uh, checking account. Okay, no tags here. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and put all locations here. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and change the date to um, February 15. Okay, February 15. And we're going to go ahead and select Madeira Builders and Lin Linda Fulton. So here's Linda Fulton and Madeira Builders. So the last two checks here, okay? Because we didn't receive them until February anyway. So in this case, February 15th is where we're going to go ahead and deposit this, okay? And then again, another line item to add in here. So again, um, Ernest, right, is the owner. So Ernest Withers. Here you go. What are we gonna do? We're gonna have an owner's investment. So investment. Okay, so here we got owner's investment right here. So now the owner is adding money. All right, description, owner, invest money, okay? What's the form of payment, right? We're going to put in a check reference number. Let's see, what was the check number that we put in here? So owner's investment, check number, reference number 200, 2001, and we're going to invest $1,000, okay? It's gonna be an overhead um, payment here, okay? for a total of $3,300. So check number 2001 for the amount of $1,000. Class is overhead because it applies to both stores, right? Okay. And once again, that's gonna give me a total of $3,330. So once that looks good, I'm gonna go ahead and save and close, okay? And there you go. I recorded this last and third deposit. So therefore, all the cash that's in my undeposited funds should be in my checking account now, right? So let's take a look. Let's take a look at that uh, deposits one more time. Deposits, I had down to $0. And then where did the money go? Let's go to my checking account. So bank, checking, 1025. We're down at 
negative three thousand six hundred dollars but let's take let's go ahead and do it so here right we have a whole bunch of changes here where we uh deposited forty dollars right that cash deposit for the for the the um for uh Neo garcia here's the one thousand eight hundred and nine dollars for the two um credit card payments here and again, the last one that we did was on the, the uh, 15th of February. Boom. We received $3,300, right? And it says split here because, again, it was two checks plus the uh, owner's investment, right? So here we increased our checking account by making all of our deposits, okay? So that is where the money goes. Now, notice, yeah, ignore this because... Remember, we haven't put our uh, begin opening balance in our checking account to very begin with. So right now, I am at negative 3000 But once we dive into Chapter 6, it will no longer be negative. It will be positive, okay? Because we still have to put our opening balances in our checking account um, to begin with, okay? All right. So that is making our deposits, okay? So once again, um, we've already reviewed making our deposits, making sure that we separate our um, different types of deposits. So again, the first one was the credit card where we added our merchant fees. The second one was cash where we um, also took out money um, in, uh, or a cash withdrawal, right? We also did a uh, deposit where we deposit our checks, also including a, a, a an additional check to um, put in as an investment, okay? So, of course, you can also print out your deposit slips, right? So, you can read that section here on how to do that, okay? All right, we already talked about QuickBooks payments, okay? Um, now, other things, too, yes, you can transfer money from all of your other applications. So that, again, that's one of the things that you can do too is that you have those applications that you can link your accounts with, so such as PayPal and Square, okay? Venmo, any type of cash app that you use to uh, transfer money. Yes, you can go ahead and also link that to your checking account and make those deposits that way as well, okay? All right. So we already reviewed our deposits in our register. So let's see. Now we're going to do printing account receivable reports or viewing them, right? Okay. Or sorry, it says running accounts uh, receivable reports. So once again, we're going to go ahead and take a look at our reports section here. So if I go to reports under uh, my uh, left navigation bar here, the section that I have for my accounts receivable is going to be the people who owe me, right? That's going to give you most of your accounts receivable um, actions here. And of course, I have my sales and customers, right? So again, for your uh, who owes you, this is where you can take a look at your uh, accounts receivable agent report. This basically shows you reports on who owes you and how often a customer will pay you. That is what that report stands for. Uh, you can take a look at collections report. So how, so how much money you collected so far. So again, we collected money from uh, Madil, uh, Madeira uh, um, and uh, Veronica, right? All of those individuals, right? For those uh, different types of um, transactions there. Uh, let's see. Uh, we can even do uh, invoices list, okay? You can even take a look at uh, your um, terms list here, okay? You got your invoices and receivable uh, received uh, payments list, okay? Uh, you can even do open invoices. So open invoices, right? So again, for all the people who still owe you money, you can toggle here that I want to see all dates, okay? And then if I go ahead and click refresh, right, it will run rerun my report. And it says here that we have these outstanding invoices that are still open. 
Now, if you remember where it says closed invoices or open invoices, closed invoices means that it's been paid off and it has been closed. Open invoices are meaning that they're still pending for uh, a payment to be received. So in this case, if you remember, we haven't received, we are, we are pending one from Liz Cannell because she only paid a partial payment. We're still pending for the Greg and Anderson, or Greg and a Andrew David for the Saturday wedding planners. And we are still uh, pending uh, for Shanette Diamond. Okay? So that's what the open invoice reports does is it basically shows you what invoices are still pending for a payment. Okay. Other things too is going to be, let's see, uh, unbilled. Okay, so we, we haven't talked about any of those yet. Uh, but if I were to go ahead and go to my sales and uh, customers, right, I'd be able to take a look at my sales report, such as um, sales by class if I wanted to. Sale, I could take a look at my products and services list. I could take a look at sales by customer. Okay. So looking at what my customers bought for me. So if I go ahead, sales by uh, customer's details. So once again, this is going to give me every single invoice or every single um, invoice that they purchased for me. So again, I'm going to go ahead and click refresh. So here, as you can see, right, we got uh, Linda Fulton, right? This is the invoice that we uh, billed her for, right? Okay, um, right, for the grand total of all these items right here. So again, it gives you every single item and which ones have been invoiced for. So again, they got uh, the, photogra the photographers, okay, and then uh, we uh, looked at uh, Madeira Builders, right, they just wanted videographers. Right, so this one gives you the actual products and services that each customer purchased from you and what invoice and what sales receipt that you bill them for. Okay, so for example, this one, uh, Chanette Diamond, right? We sold to her the um, Supra camera, which included the uh, camera, lens, and case, right? All right here it gives you the exact items that you sold to that particular person. Okay. And then uh, let's see what else other things that we could do. So sales, you could do your uh, sales list there. Sales by, oh, sorry, wait a second. Sales by customer, right? We could even do sales by location. So you could see which location sold more products. So in this case, I do sales by location. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and change this to all dates. And this will tell you the exact location that you sold your products and services, right? So this first one right here is for your San Jose location. So these are the total products and services you sold for that one. And of course, my Walnut Creek, which is a definitely much more popular. These are the items and things that you sold for that particular um, store, okay? So again, very powerful information when you can run reports, especially looking at what these reports can do for you, right? This could tell, right? If I'm doing a sales report based on location, right? I need to do something to get my San Jose store to reach the same potential as my Walnut Creek, right? And I can see which customers are buying more products, right? So maybe I need to sell more to those uh, customers or do something to entice the other customers who don't buy as much to buy more, right? Whatever it is that you are trying to do, uh, that is exactly what these questions can answer for you. So again, you can even look at the, the sales by product and services, right? You could see which product or which service do you sell the most of, okay? And I'm going to do all dates here and click refresh. So you can see which product and service is the most popular. Which one have you sold the most of? Okay. So in this case, right, um, it seems to be that my uh, camera, I've sold so far three of them. So that's so far my most uh, popular product here. Okay. 
All right. So there you go. Those are your reports for accounts receivable slash sales. Okay. All right. So uh, let's see. That should end this uh, section here for chapter three. So now that we are completely done with chapter three, let's go ahead and go over the review questions, the multiple choice section right here. So again, select the best answers for each of the following. Okay. So let's take a look here. Question number one. Okay. Okay. Number one, in the new customer window, you find everything except, okay? So let's see, A, customer name. Of course, that's going to be there, right? You're, you're, ed you're entering a new customer. You need the customer's name. Customer's billing and shipping addresses. Of course, right? You need If, if you're going to invoice them, how are you going to send them their bill? You're going to have a billing address. Okay, customer tax info. Okay, in this case, is that something that is going to be on there? Customer tax info. Um, in this case, it's probably looking at. It's probably going to look at whether um, a customer is taxable or not. Right, whether you can choose to tax exempt them or not. So that will probably be most likely their uh, customer tax info. And then, of course, right, so you could actually um, designate a certain tax, uh, tax county for each of those customers. And then last but not least, D says year-to-date sales information. No, you don't see that on the new customer's info, right? You see that on the customer center. Yes, you get to see their account balances, but you will not actually be entering in or uh, viewing that under the new customer window, right? You're not going to have a year-to-date sales info. Okay? That's going to be a report or if you're going to be putting in uh, past invoices to create that, but you are not going to do that in, in the setup window for the new customer. Okay? Number two. Okay. You should record sales receipts when the customer pays. Okay, so letter A, by cash, check, or credit card at time of sale, which is ding, 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 your answer right there. Okay, it is not by cash, um, check, or credit card at the end of the month, right? That's, that's you choosing to pay later. And of course, you're not going to do sales tax on the purchases. That has nothing to do with sales receipts, okay? And of course, their invoice. Invoices are not the same thing as sales receipts, okay? Number three, which statement is false, okay? So let's take a look at all the answers here. Letter A, invoices are very similar to the sales receipt, okay? Yes. We've already mentioned this. The only difference between a sales receipt and an invoice is whether the customer paid or not, right? They have the section where for the sales receipt, you receive a payment, where the invoice doesn't have that section, right? Okay, so yes, A is true. They are very similar to each other, okay? B says invoices decrease accounts receivable. Is that true? Well, invoices, right, if you fill your customers with an invoice. Therefore, you're having the customer owe you money. In this case, you're increasing your accounts receivable. So in this case, letter B, this statement is false, okay? Sales receipt has no effect on accounts receivable, which is true because again, sales receipt does not have to do with anything with an accounts receivable because accounts receivable represents that a customer owes you money. If a sales receipt has the customer pay at time of service or at time of sale, therefore has no effect over accounts receivable because they're not owing you any money, okay? And letter D says invoices should be created when customers are going to pay after the date of, ser of sale. Yes, right? So again, we use invoices when customers choose to pay later. 
So that is true. So letter B is the correct answer for the false statement. Okay. Number four. Okay. You may specify payment terms on the uh, new customer window. However, okay. So this is a this is a, a condition statement. All right, however, let's take a look at all the answers. A says the payment terms uh, will only show on the sales receipt transactions. Is that true? However, the payment terms uh, will only show on the sales receipt transactions. No, that's not true, right? Because it appears on the invoices as well. So that's not true. B says the terms can only be changed once a year. No. You can adjust, modify, or maybe this time, maybe a customer is a frequent customer, so you decided to just change the terms on them and give them a discounted term. No, it's not permanent. You can make adjustments on the actual sales receipt itself. And we did that example with Mr. Stephen Boswell, right? Uh, where we uh, entered in a discounted term. But this is for... Can be a, these terms can also be applied to customers as well. If you can change it on a bill, you can also change it on a sales receipt, right? They allow you to do that, okay? B, uh, C says the sales uh, representative must be informed. No, this is, a, this is a giving a term. The sales representative has nothing to do with giving terms out. And then lastly, D says you are also permitted to override the terms on each sale. Yes, I just mentioned that as an option that you can do. So D is the correct answer, right? Because it is permitted, meaning it is allowable to make changes on the each sales form. Okay. Number five, your company has just accepted a payment for an invoice. Okay, what should you do? in QuickBooks online to record this payment. So once again, let's take a look at the answers. Okay, uh, number five, A, open the invoice by clicking on the invoice icon on the, on the dashboard. No, that's just viewing the invoice. That has nothing to do with receiving payments. Uh, B says create a sales receipt by clicking on the sales receipt. Okay, again, you never use a sales receipt to receive a payment, okay? C, make a deposit by clicking on the record deposits icon on the dashboard. No, because again, uh, you do, you're not collecting the money, right? Because before we make a deposit, you need to collect the money in the first place. And then letter D says you're going to receive the payment by clicking on the receive payments icon. So yes, letter D is true, okay? Number six, which statement is false? So another, we're going to look for another false statement here. A, okay, your form date should be the date that the transaction occurred. Is that true? Yes. Oh, remember, we, we, we had this discussion in accounting, right, where when you record a bill or when you invoice your customers, right, you usually bill them the same day that you have the service either, um, you know, has been either completed or is going to be for a future uh, date, right? Whenever the customer decides to come in and they request for it and they, uh, you you're, are able to invoice them at that time. But we also have to remember when we record our transactions, we have to to record them in chronological order, meaning the day that it happened, you need to record it. So that is 100% true. That is the accrual basis of type of accounting. Your form date should be the date that the transaction has occurred. Okay, so that is using the accrual basis. Letter B says that you, ca you can have a form date and a uh, separate service date on a sales form. Yes, right? Well, we took a look at Liz Cadell. We invoiced her on the 21st of January, and the videographers is, was scheduled to do 
uh, the to complete the job on the 28th. So yes, you can have a separate date for both service and um, invoicing dates. They can be different. Okay. Uh, letter C, your form date should be the date that you create the transaction. Now, in this case, not necessarily, right? The form date should be the uh, date that you create the, the transaction. Not necessarily, okay? Because creating a transaction, it can be different from when you do your service, right? So in this case, not necessarily. Yes, you can create the transaction, but it doesn't have to be that very same day, right? You could always invoice them at a later date, right? Yes, you can create your... your um, your form however you'd like, but that doesn't necessarily mean you need to bill them uh, the time that you create the transaction, right? Only when it occurs, okay? So letter D says that you don't need to type in um, a leading, you don't need to type in leading zeros and uh, the full year when, uh, when entering in the date. Okay, in this case, that is true. You don't need to enter it in because you have that little calendar icon to go ahead and enter in your dates, right? And that's the best way to utilize it because you want to make sure you don't make any typos along the way. Uh, so again, you don't need to. That is true. You don't need to type in anything because you can use a little calendar icon next to the date. Okay, so in this case, your correct answer is letter C, right? You don't need to date it the day that you create it. You only date it when the uh, service has been completed or when you choose to invoice somebody and have a service date to be completed later on. Okay. Number seven, okay? To record a deposit in QuickBooks Online, what do you do? Okay, so let's take a look at the answers. A says you're going to make a separate deposit that includes both checks and cash receipts. Okay, that is that is true. B says you're going to make a separate deposit that includes both Visa and MasterCard receipts. So yes, credit card payments. Yes, you're going to do a separate one because you also need to include that merchant fee. Okay, letter C says you're going to make sure that each deposit total um, matches the banking feed or bank statement. So in this case, yes, that's also true too, that you wanna make sure that when you uh, do your deposits, right, you're gonna have a banking slip, right, a deposit slip. You're gonna make sure that it matches that, right? But in this case, what it's talking about is if you if you connect your bank account to your QuickBooks Online, so we'll talk about that in chapter six, okay? Your bank feed should reflect the total amount that you deposited, right? Because you're linking your bank account to QuickBooks. And of course, if you're using online banking or mobile app, right? You can log into your uh, banking application and be able to see your deposit. It should match. That's your bank statement there. Okay? So D, all of the above is true. Okay? Number eight. Okay? Your company has First, or so it has just uh, received an order, okay, for rummy customer who will pay you within 30 days, okay? So how should you record this transaction in QuickBooks Online? So let's take a look at the answers. Letter A says create an invoice by clicking on uh, invoices on the plus new icon bar. Yes. That is 100% true, right? Because if this person is promising to pay you in 30 days later, what kind of form are you going to use? You're definitely going to use an invoice, okay? B says you're going to create um, a uh, sales receipt by clicking on sales receipt. So once again, they're not paying you at time of sale. So B is incorrect. Uh, C says make a deposit by clicking on make a depo bank deposit. No, you're not going to make a deposit because you never received the money in the first place. And then D says receive the payment by clicking on receive payment. They're paying you in 30 days. So that has nothing to do with, with recording the sale. So in this case, you're not recording a, uh, recording a payment. Okay, so 
correct answer for this question is letter A. Okay. Number nine. Okay. When you make a deposit, all of the following are true except. So another false statement that we're looking for. Okay. So number nine. Letter A says you must print a deposit slip uh, in order to process a deposit. Now, that statement is 100% false, okay? Now, what is the purpose of printing out deposit slips before you make your deposit? Well, that just makes it that much more easy and faster to go ahead and uh, submit to your bank because um, if you already have the deposit slip ready to go, all your information is already on that deposit slip and you have the correct amount of the cash and everything that you're making on your deposit. So then that just allows the bank to process it a lot more quickly. Now, usually rule of thumb is that if you don't have a deposit slip readily available and you appear to the bank, to the bank um, institute and you go ahead and deposit your uh, money, what happens is the bank teller or the banker is going to give you a deposit slip for you to fill out all your information, such as your name, your account number, your amount that you're depositing. So in this case, no, you don't have to have the bank deposit ahead of time because if you don't, the bank is going to give you a deposit slip for you to fill out. Okay, so letter A is already the clear one that is the uh, that is false. Okay, and of course, all the, re the rest of them are true. Okay. Number 10, which statement is true in regards to subtotals and or it, subtotals on invoices okay so letter a we have here subtotals do not do not need to be used on invoices because they the total is calculated automatically well let's see which statement is true i mean technically we're looking at what statement is true in regards to using subtotals. Now, again, this is slightly true because, again, at the bottom of your form, you should have the subtotals, the, not the subtotal, but the total total of the bill already calculated for you. But in this case, this is using a subtotal line. Now, in this case, no. If you're trying to subtotal certain areas in your invoice, no, it's not, it's not done for you automatically. You do have to add that subtotal line in there. So in this case, that's not technically true. Okay? So let's see B. Okay? B says a subtotal um, always calculates the amount of all the lines above it. Yes. So that's why it was very specific when we did um, this Liz Cannell when she uh, wanted the camera and the, 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 the case and she wanted that to be subtotaled. When we did the subtotal line item, it calculated all the, the, the total calculations of that amount from the two lines above it. And it did not include the third one in there because when we put the third one in there, which added up the, sub, the total amount at the bottom, but it calculated the subtotal for the two line items above. So in this case, B is true. It's always going to uh, give you the subtotal of the amount of the items above it. Okay. Let us see. You have to use a subtotal on every invoice. No. Like I've mentioned before, if you are not making a separation between the items that are listed in your invoice, it's going to be automatically calculated at the bottom anyway. Okay. And then D says a subtotal... Uh, uses the amount of the uh, preceding lines to calculate its amount. A subtotal uses the amount of the preceding line. Okay, so when it says preceding line, meaning it's just the pre, it's just the one above it. No, that's not true. Okay, it does everything above it. So your correct answer here is letter B. Okay, which is going to give you the total of everything above that line item. Okay. Number 11. 
when creating a customer re record, okay, which statement is false? So let's look for this false statement here for number 11, okay? So letter A says, okay, after you entered in a display name, okay, in the customer information window, you cannot use that name, okay, in any of the uh, other name listed in the QuickBooks Online, okay? So in this case, that is true, right? We talked about this. You can't have two of the same name under the display name, right? I gave you the example we said mentioned earlier, right? You can't have two employees with the same exact name because it's QuickBooks is not going to differentiate the two, okay? Even though you add all the information that you want in there in regards to that um, employee information, right? Sit for different social security number. Because you're using the display name, which is what the um, QuickBooks is using as the algorithm to be able to search those um, individuals for you, you cannot have two of the same exact name in QuickBooks. Okay, so that is true. That statement is true. And we're looking for the statement that is false. All right, so let's see uh, B. B says that you can set defaults uh, for the customer sales tax status, okay, and payment terms. Yes, you can, right? When you when you set up your cu your customer's profile, right, you're setting those defaults by setting up those tax um those tax and those terms statuses right in it. So that is true, okay. Number 11, a sales rep must be selected when creating a new customer. No. If you remember, a sales rep is a custom field. We created that to be put on our sales form. So then that's additional information that is in regards to our forms. So in this case, no. Not every company requires or has a sales representative to even select in the first place. So in this case, that is 100% false. You're not obligated to have a sales rep to be selected. Okay, so therefore D is going to be true. Okay. All right, so the correct answer for question 11 for the false statement is C. Okay. Number 13, okay. When receiving payment from your customers to whom you have sent invoices, okay, you must, okay, so what happens when you um, receive payments for the customers that you build in this case, okay? So question number 13, letter A, says you're going to receive the payment um, in full, Partial payments cannot be accepted in QuickBooks Online. Is that true? No. You can always accept partial payments. So again, we already did an example, right? We took a look at Liz Cadell, who gave us a partial payment. She only paid for a portion of her bill that we uh, that we uh, sent her, right? For the camera and the let for the camera and the case, right? She only paid us half for the invoice or a partial of the invoice. So in this case, that is 100% false. Yes, you can. Um, yes, you can receive partial payments. So that is definitely not the answer here. Okay. Uh, letter B says enter in the enter. Enter them directly into the checking account register. So in this case, yes, you can actually enter in a receive payments. Okay, hold on, let me see. Um, so in this case, uh, you must enter them directly into the checking account register.
Okay. So, uh, in this case, um, that is actually false because remember, if you receive a payment from an invoice that you previously invoiced in your customer, right? This transaction, if you just put it directly into the checking account, what you're doing is you're not decreasing the account receivable. So in this case, that is completely false. You cannot do that, right? You need to receive the payment in order to reduce that in that uh, account receivable account. And then you have the next step, which is to record that deposit to go to actually de to uh, deposit it into your checking account. So in this case, letter B is actually false. You cannot do that. Okay. Then letter C, you're going to be entering in the payment in, the it, payment into the receive payments window, and then um, you're going to check off that the appropriate um, invoices um, in which that the payment applies to. So in this case, that is the proper step right here, right? You're going to receive the payment so that you essentially reduce the accounts receivable. Okay, and then D says delete the invoice uh, so that um, it does not show on the customer's open risk, open records. Now, you in this case, you if you delete it, that means you never made the sale. So in this case, because you've already invoiced them and you receive a payment, to, then you're going to uh, keep that invoice there and just do letter C to do it correctly. Okay. Question 13, you're going, you need to uh, calculate the amount of bank card fees by multiplying the amount of the received payments by negative 3%. What useful QuickBooks online feature would you use, right? So then I use a lot of terminology here. Right, so if you remember, right, if you're gonna punch into calculations, right, we call that quick math. So in this case, letter B is the correct answer. You're gonna be doing quick math. Not calculating items, not quick add, and definitely not um, the fees button. There is no such thing as the fees button, okay? It's gonna be using quick math, where you're going to be punching in the calculation directly into the amount a little window and it will automatically calculate that for you using quick math okay number 14 okay the undeposited funds account tracks okay so again what does it track a um bad debt no right we didn't talk about bad debt because that's you that's when a customer refuses to pay or does not cannot can no longer pay so therefore, you're going to be accumulating bad debt, okay? So that's definitely not the answer. B says funds that have been received but not yet deposited, right? There you go, right? Hence the key word, undeposited funds. They have yet to be deposited. So letter B is your correct answer, okay? Last question here for the chapter is question number 15. Uh, when typing in an existing customer name, okay, in a form. And, of course, a dialog box opens up and suggests that you need to create them, okay? What should you do? So, again, remember, here's the key word here. You type in an existing customer. So, this person already exists in your books. But for some reason, you get a dialog box saying that you needed to you need to add them into your books. What should you do? Okay. So if this person already exists, and it's telling you to create a file for them, what should you do? So let's see. Letter A. You're gonna add the customer to the customers list again. No. Like we mentioned before, right? If you already have this person existing in your company list, there shouldn't be any reason why you have to um, add them in again, right? All right, 
B says, try uh, a vendor name instead. No, if you're trying to look for a customer, you don't need to try to look up a vendor's name, okay? Letter C says, click on uh, cancel, and then go ahead and click, uh, you're going to click on cancel to check the name that you entered in for any typos. So then, yes, and then just type it in again. And that would be the correct answer because in this case, this person already exists in your company file. So therefore, it's either you made a typo or mistake and you need to go ahead and re-enter that name in again to be able to refine that name. Okay. Now, oftentimes, you can have a glitch in the system, right? Maybe your internet is down, so uh, you might have to give it a few seconds to go ahead and uh, search that for you. But like I've said, right, every information that you put into QuickBooks is essentially you're doing, you're building a database, right, that allows you to make it feasible and easier to search up and look up the people in the clientele list and every list that you create in QuickBooks, right? So if you already have it pre-existing, double check the type that you're typing in. Maybe you maybe mistype the person's name in the first place, right? So you might have to go ahead and um, click that drop down menu. Maybe you can look up their name that way. Okay. And again, none of the above is not the answer. All right. So that concludes chapter three, the sales process. Okay. All right. And then we'll resume the lesson with the chapter 5.2, where we deal with what happens when customers make a refund or we have to issue customer um, credits, which we call credit memos.